Thanks, Caden. Good day, everyone. My name is Matt. If you don't know me, let's pray and then let's have a look at that passage together. Father, you have not remained silent, but you have spoken to us through your word. We thank you for that. We thank you that we can hear from you. And Father, now as we look at this great sermon, or the start of it, on the lips of Jesus, that you would show us today what the blessed life actually is, and that we would live in response to that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, the main section that we're going to be looking at today, uh, verses 20 to 26, has been uh, come to be known as the Beatitudes. Now, that's just a, a, from a Latin word that just means happy and blessed. Uh, and it's the start of a much larger bit of teaching or a sermon from Jesus that's uh, known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you, you see uh, that's also recorded in Matthew's Gospel. It's a longer version there in Matthew's Gospel. But uh, we're going uh, through the Gospel of Luke at the moment. And here uh, in chapter 6, we get a more condensed version of it. And we're going to take the next uh, three weeks to look at this. Um, the thing is, of all Jesus' teachings uh, in the Gospels, the Beatitudes, verses 20 to 26, have been the thing that I have found personally the most are troubling to understand, trying to figure out what exactly they would mean for my life. Uh, I've never really known what to do with them. I find them quite confusing and confronting even as I read them. And so my default's just been to read it quickly and then move on to the next thing. And just sort of leave. Does anyone else ever do that when you read in the Bible? The Bible, Sam, Sam does that. I can see that. When you get to something that's confusing... You just sort of pass over it and go on to the next bit. The problem is, though, today I have to get up and say something about this. I, I, I just wish once, this has never happened in the whole time I've been at church, but I wish, I wish just once a preacher would get up and say, you know what, I have no idea what this passage is about, and then just go and sit down. And go, You guys figure it out for yourselves. I'd love to, I'd love to see that happen one day. Not today, though. I'd probably get fired, so I better say something. Now, why have I found this all so difficult? Well, it's because as I read it, I can't help but get the feeling that my life doesn't look like what Jesus is describing here in the Beatitudes. What Jesus describes here of the blessed life is so different to what I consider, what our world considers to be the blessed life. But if that's the case, well, then I need to change the way that I see things. Because after all, for all those of us who would call ourselves Christians, we, we think Jesus is God. And therefore, if God sees the world differently to me, it's not him that needs to change, is it? It's me. It's you. And so what I want us to do today as we work through this passage is to I, I want to show you what I've done this week to try and figure out what it's actually saying, what Jesus is saying here, and then figure out, well, what does that mean for us? What, how, what would have to change in our lives if we were to live the blessed life that Jesus is speaking about here? Now, if you go to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at the first section a day. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but it goes through to the end of chapter 6. At the end of chapter 6, in verses 46 to 49, Jesus concludes the sermon by uh, talking about you can build your life on his words. He says, if you not only listen to my words, but put them into practice in your life, then your, your life will be built on a sure foundation. But it is also a warning. He says that if you don't listen to my words, if you don't put them into practice in your life, that when the storms of life come, and they will for all of us, he says you will have no foundation and it's all going to come crashing down. Now, I don't want that to happen, and I'm sure you don't want that to happen in your life either. And so let me, let me take you through what I've discovered this week as I've dug into this passage, not flipped over and gone to the next thing, as I've dug in and seen what is going on there. Now, we're going to have to do some hard work, but you can have tomorrow off. How about that? You can take tomorrow off, public holiday. Sorry if you have to work. Let's jump in. Let's have a look. Now, the first thing you want to do as you're opening up 
uh, the Bible is pay attention to the context of what's going on. What has happened up until this point in the Gospel of Luke? Now, the Gospels aren't just a bunch of random stories that have all just been sort of compiled together. No, Luke carefully has investigated everything and placed it in a particular order to show the larger story of who Jesus is. And so the context here is important. And what we're going to see as we look at the context is that this is a key moment in Jesus's ministry. Think back with me over the last couple of chapters as we've been working our way through chapters four to six. Jesus has really burst onto the scene here. He's gone from obscurity, he's burst onto the scene. In Luke uh, 4 verse 18, uh, what Luke records is Jesus' first public teaching as he stands up in his home synagogue in the town of Nazareth and he speaks or he gets the scroll of, of Isaiah, that famous passage from Isaiah 61. And he says this, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And all the eyes are on Jesus. And then he says, today, this scripture that was written six, seven hundred years before Jesus was born is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Everything that you've been waiting for, your great, these great promises that you've heard that of someone who's going to come and rescue you, who's going to preach this good news to you, the hope of which your nation has been built on, that's me. And then he starts going out and teaching and healing and these great, great crowds of people start coming to him from everywhere and he starts calling people to follow him and they do. And then a couple of weeks ago, he started teaching about the wine skin and the patches. Remember that one? And he's talking about how there's this new thing that I'm bringing and it doesn't fit with the old way of Judaism. They're, they're, they don't fit together. And then last week, we saw the opposition of the Pharisees, the old way, coming up against Jesus. And they started discussing among themselves how they might even kill him. And then you get to the start of today's passage. Remember, Caden just read it out in verses 12 to 16 with Jesus choosing the apostles. Now, often you get to passages like that just to list the names. You sort of read through them quickly, make a note. Don't call your child Judas. That's a bad name. <laughs> Got to feel sorry for the second Judas in there, the one who didn't betray Jesus. Now, why did Jesus choose, choose 12? Just a nice round number. You know, most of your community groups have about 12 people in them. It's not too big, not too small, just a good number. Is that what he, what he was doing? No, he chose 12, the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, the people of God. Now, as he is bringing in this new kingdom, he, bring, he chooses 12 apostles who will go on to be the foundation and the start of the new people of God that he is bringing. And it's with all that lead up, with all that context, that we get to his first major teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. His vision to this new people of God that he is gathering. Everything he's been, uh, is, has been building to this moment uh, where Jesus comes down the mountain and preaches to this great crowd that has gathered. We've been waiting for this picture this whole time. There it is. We're finally at the, at, at the picture. Okay, well, that's the context. Next thing I want to show you is the structure of these verses, of verses 20 to 26 of the Beatitudes. So grab your Bible. It would be great to have that open in front of you. Have a look at verses 20 to 26. There's, there's two clear sections here. The first one is uh, verses 20 to 23, and there there's four blessed statements. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Four of them. Now, blessed here is is what God thinks or what God sees as the good life. Uh, then in verses 24 to 26, they're followed up by four woe statements. Uh, woe being the opposite of blessing. It's a danger. It's a, uh, it's a warning. It's a, it's a curse. And he says, but woe is you who are rich. Woe is you. Four of those. Now, what you notice is each of the blessed statements corresponds to its opposite woe statement. And so, blessed are you who are poor, 
corresponds with woe to you who are rich and blessed are you who are hungry to woe to you who are full. And on it goes. They have their corresponding statements to each other. Now, that's the structure. That's, that's simple enough, easy enough to understand. But now comes the hard bit because the question is, well, what does this all mean? All right? So let's, let's dig in and take a look. Now, next thing I want to do is I want to share with you four things that as I dug into this, they stood out to me. And I think they'll be helpful in trying to get to an understanding of this, what Jesus is saying here. So four things that, I, I, that stood out as I looked at it. First one is this. It says, the blessed are not the people that you would expect. The blessed are not the ones you would expect. Now, if you were going to uh, post a hashtag blessed photo on social media, something I can say I've never done, hands, be honest, hands up if you've ever posted a hashtag blessed photo. Yeah, no one ever wants to. <laughs> one person up the back, thanks for admitting that. I'm sure there's more of you. This is the kind of photo you would uh, probably put up if you're going to do a hashtag blessed post. I don't know who this guy is. Apparently he's famous. <laughs> this is the... Most liked photo ever on Instagram. 30 million people liked this post. Apparently he's famous. Now, they're the kinds of photos you're going to post, aren't you? Hashtag blessed. It's, it's photos of holidays or time with family or good food that you've got to enjoy. That's the blessed life, isn't it? It's things that make you happy and give you joy that's what it means to live the good life. And so you'd expect Jesus to, to say something like, blessed to you who are rich, blessed to you who are well-fed and who laugh, and blessed to you, excuse me, when everyone speaks well of you. That's not what he says. He says, blessed to you who are poor, blessed to you who are hungry, blessed to you who weep. And blessed to you when people hate you and exclude you. You're not going to post photos about those things, are you? They're not going to get likes. In fact, it's these things that we actively try and avoid in life, isn't it? No one wants to be poor. No one wants to go hungry. I don't mean like you forgot to have breakfast this morning and you have to wait till a cafe afterwards. I mean, not knowing where your next meal is coming from. No one wants to be hated and excluded. And yet Jesus says, these are the people who are blessed. But then he goes further because he then contrasts it with a series of woes, as we saw. He says, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed. Woe to you who laugh. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. <clears throat> Aren't these the sorts of things that we think are the blessed life, though? So what's going on? How is it that Jesus can say these things? How is it, well, what does he know that we don't? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. But that's, that's the first thing I noticed, that the blessed are not the people you would expect. Second thing I noticed as I looked at this is that Jesus follows up each one of his blessed statements and each one of his woe statements with a why, the why they're blessed or why, why the woe. Let's have a look at verse 20. It says, Blessed are you who are poor. Why? Well, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, there's an important distinction here that I think you, you need to understand if you're going to understand what's going on here. It's not being poor that is the blessing. What Jesus is saying is, you are blessed because even though you're poor, you have the kingdom of God. See the distinction there? You see the same thing in the next one, verse 21. It says, blessed are you who hunger now. Why? For you will be satisfied. You are blessed because even though you are hungry now, there's a time coming when you will be satisfied. It's not, hungry isn't the blessing. It's the future satisfaction that means you're blessed. Do you see the difference there? It's important to understand that difference. And you get the same with the woes. Verse 24, woe to you who are rich. Why? For you have already received your comfort. In other words, the problem isn't about being rich. 
the problem or the curse of being rich is that it's temporary. It's fleeting. As in you can't take it with you, as we say. Or again in verse 25, Woe to you who are well fed now. Why? For you will go hungry. Again, the curse isn't that you're well fed. It's a warning to those who are well fed that it might later lead to hunger. And so the second thing that I noticed was that Jesus provides a why for each of these blessings and woes. The third thing that stood out as I read it was that there's a future reversal that takes place. Did you notice that? You see it there with the the time language. So the tense of what Jesus says. Have a look, verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger now, present tense, for you will be satisfied. Future tense. Or again, next verse. Blessed are you who weep now, present, for you will laugh. Same with the woes. Woe to you who are well fed now, present tense, you will go hungry. And woe to you who laugh now, you will mourn and weep. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Because there seems to be a, a now but not yet aspect to it. I don't know if you noticed that. Have a look back to verse 20, because it says, there we go. Oh, did I miss it? You guys can figure it out. It says, verse 20, Blessed are you who are poor present, for yours is the kingdom of God. Also present. And so there's this now but not yet. There's this tension that the kingdom of God is yours now. You belong to it now. But there's a future time coming where this reversal will, will take place, where it will come into effect. And so I think it's important to see the tension there, the now but not yet of the reversal. And then fourthly, fourth thing that stood out to me is the who. Who is Jesus talking to as he gives these beatitudes? Have a look at verse 20. Because there's this great crowd that are gathered to hear it. But Luke says, looking at his disciples, Jesus said. In other words, it's not a generic message to everyone who's there who's poor and hungry and weeping and persecuted. This, he's specifically speaking here to his disciples, the ones who have left everything to follow him. Now, later on in the sermon, and we'll look at this next week, <clears throat> in verse 27, Jesus will widen his address to the great crowd of people that has gathered. And like I said, we'll look at that next week. But here... In verses 20 to 26, in the Beatitudes, he's speaking specifically to his disciples. And again, I think this is key to understanding what Jesus is saying here. Okay, so I looked at the context. We looked at the structure uh, and the things that stood out for me as I looked at it this week. But the question remains, what does this all mean? How is it that Jesus can say these things that just seem so upside down to us? Tim Keller calls it the upside down kingdom. Everything's upside down. The blessed are the ones without and the ones with are the ones Jesus says, woe to you. It's confronting as you read them, isn't it? Because they're the opposite of how we think about life. As you read through the Beatitudes, it's clear that Jesus sees this world differently to how we do. And so how is it that he can say these things? Well, I think it's because he sees life very differently than the way you do. He steps into our world and he says, this life is not all there is. There's more than just the here and now. Jesus can see past the 70 or 80 years that we get into eternity, into the kingdom of heaven. And in comparison, he says, this life is just like a drop in the ocean. Now, think about it. Think about your life for a minute. I just turned 41. It's about double the age of most of the people in this room. I, I can remember, remember back when I was 21. It felt like just yesterday. Like, what has happened to the last 20 years? Now, maybe I've got another tw- uh, 40 years left. Maybe. We'll see how we go. But what's going to happen then? I'm going to die. And so are you. Now, you guys are mostly young. You probably think you're going to live forever. I said in the 9 o'clock service, you guys are going to die soon. 
You guys don't think you're going to die, but you will. You guys are going to die, just like me. It's the certainty of this life. You will die. Jesus' brother, get, he got it. James in chapter 4 says, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. And Jesus constantly spoke about this, he, the, the difference between this life and the next. He said, said things like in Matthew uh, 6, Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Or things like Luke 12, Don't be afraid, little th- flock. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. To sell your possessions, give them to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail. Or Mark 8, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? What he's saying is lift up your eyes. See that this life is not all there is. That if you focus on the 80 or so years you have here, you might miss out on something that's more important, on the kingdom of heaven. The problem is, that's not how we see things, is it? We focus on the here and now. Randy Alcorn says it this way. He says, many Christians dread the thought of leaving this world. Why? Because so many have stored up their treasures on earth, not in heaven. Each day brings us closer to death. And if your treasures are on earth, that means that each day brings you closer to losing your treasures. What is your focus on? Is it on the here and now? Storing up for yourself treasures on earth? Or is it on eternity? Remember, who was it that Jesus was speaking to here? It was his disciples, wasn't it? The the ones who had left everything behind to follow him. They're the ones who'd become poor and hungry and weeping and persecuted to follow him. But Jesus looks at them and says, you guys are the ones who are blessed. might not look like it to everyone else around you, but you're the blessed ones. You're the ones who have the good life. What Jesus is getting his disciples to do is look beyond this world to the next. It's, it's an encouragement that he's giving them here. It's, a, it's comfort as he says this to them. He says, you're living the blessed life, not, not because you're poor and hungry and weak and, and persecuted, but because there's a future coming. And that's, that's bigger than the here and now. You see, you see it in verse 22. And he says, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of Jesus, because of the Son of Man. Why? He says, rejoice in that day, as in the day when you're persecuted, the day when people hate you. You can rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Jesus is saying to the disciples, lift your eyes beyond the here and the now. See that there is something better, that this age is just a fleeting moment. And then there's eternity. Grace City, do you believe that? Do you live like that? Or have you lost focus on that great reality of the age to come? Be careful not just to live for the here and now. It'll be over before you know it. And if that's all you live for, it's all going to come to an end. And you can't take it with you. Let Jesus refocus your life so that you can see beyond the here and now to the kingdom of heaven. To eternity. There's still something more, I think, to what Jesus is saying here in the, in the Beatitudes than just to focus on the life to come. There's something more to it. And this is what I've been wrestling with this week, trying to, trying to figure this out. How is it 
that the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the, those who are persecuted are the blessed ones? How is it that that is the blessed life? Well, here, here's my best attempt to understand it. When is it that you're most likely to turn to God? When is it in your life that you're most likely to, to run to him? It's not when things are going good in your life, is it? It's not when you're rich and well-fed and laughing and people are speaking well of you. No, it's, it's when you're suffering. It's when you're weeping. It's when you don't have enough money and you don't know who to turn to. Those are the times that you realize that you're not in control and you turn to God and depend on him. I'm sure this is true of others, but it's been the, the lowest times in my own life that have been the times, oddly, that I felt the closest to God because all those other things have been stripped away and I've run to him for comfort. And in those moments, those temporary things that take such a grip of us didn't seem to have that same hold on me. I could see past them. Now, there's this, this great theme that runs through the pages of Scripture about the poor and the rich. Now, it doesn't apply in every circumstance. There's examples in the Bible of rich people who are dependent on, on God. You look at the book of Job, Job in the Old Testament. He's a rich guy who depended on God. Levi, we'll meet later on in uh, Luke's gospel. He's a rich guy that depends on God. But generally, there's this theme that runs through the pages of the Bible about the poor and the rich. The poor person is the one who is under no illusion that they are in control of their own life. They're the ones who can't rely on their wealth and so they cry out to God for help and depend on him. They're under no illusion that they can be self-reliant. But the rich, in the pages of the scripture, they're the ones who don't need to depend on God. They have their wealth, and money is power. And so they're fooled into thinking that they are in control, that they have security in themselves because of their wealth. And so they don't need God. You see it in parables like the rich fool, which we'll see again later on in Luke's gospel. The rich fool is the one who thinks he has life in control. He's stored up many things for himself. And so he takes life easy. He says, I'll eat, I'll drink, and I'll be merry. But God says to him, you fool. Our wealth can fool us into thinking that we've got everything in control. But God says, you fool, you're going to die one day and stand before me and what good will your money be? Now, Grace City, this is us. We're the rich ones. And Jesus says here, woe to you who are rich. I think we need to take that seriously. Don't read over it too quickly and theologize how that's not talking about you. We're the rich ones. We can be so easily fooled into thinking we, our life is in our control. And so how do we not fall for it? How do we, in our riches, in our wealth, how do we not fall for the trap in thinking we're in control and not God? Well, listen to Jesus' warning. He says, woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort, the comfort of being rich, that, it's over. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Grace City, don't be fooled by the temporary things of the here and now. The things that will disappear in a second. Things that can fool us into thinking that we're self-reliant and we don't need God. But instead, trust him when he says who the blessed ones are. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. 
Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and you reject uh, and are rejected uh, your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. That is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Do you see how freeing it would be if we actually believed this and lived like this? If we, that's the view of life that we had with a view of eternity. We're going to go on in the next couple of weeks to look at the rest of this sermon. And he's going to speak about giving things away, loving others by giving, giving it away. If, that's, if we actually believe this, we would be able to do that. Now, does this, does this mean we have to give everything away and become poor? Is that, is that what he's saying here? Honestly, I don't know. I've been wrestling with this all week. Maybe. At the very least, it would mean to hold on to our work, hold on to the things that we have very loosely, be willing to give them away if that's what's needed, particularly if, it, if they distract us from focusing on God. We'd be so free if we lived like Jesus says here, if we saw this as the blessed life. We would live like Jesus. And that's what it means to be a disciple, to follow him. Do you see why this passage is so confronting? <laughs> because Jesus confronts everything that we think and turns it upside down. He takes what we think is a blessed life and says, that's a curse. And this is the blessed life. And so don't just read it too quickly and then just move on. Let it haunt you a little bit this week. It's haunted me all week. It's your turn now. It can haunt you for a little while. Let Jesus change the way you see what the blessed life actually is. Let him lift your eyes from the here and now to eternity and see this life in light of the great reality to come. Now, when you read words like this, they seem so weak and foolish, don't they? It's the opposite of everything our world sees as the blessed life. But that's the God we follow. We follow a God who takes the weak and the foolish things of this world to show his power and his strength. That's the cross. That's what Jesus does at the cross. It's in such a weak and a foolish act. He shows God's power and his wisdom. That is the God we follow. Well, that's all I got. That's all I got on this passage. I hope that's of some help, but don't run too quickly from it. Spend some time digging into it. Maybe take some time tomorrow, read over it. Ask God to lift your eyes. Ask God to reshape what it is that you see as the blessed life. But let me pray and let me ask God to, ask God to do that. Father, when we come to passages like this in your word, they are confronting. We often don't know what to do with them because they're so different to the way we think about life. So, Father, would you help us to see things the way you see them? Would you help us to see the blessed life as what it is and to seek to live out that life? Lord, would you show us the things in our lives that so easily distract us and cause us to focus on the here and now and not on you would you show us what they are would you help us to hold them lightly and if we need to give them away so that we can live for you and for your kingdom we pray this in jesus name amen